<clears throat> All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of Stories from a Mountain Town podcast here. Uh, I am your host, Tyler Meany, as always. And today with me, I have a longtime friend of mine, one of my best friends ever, Joel Rosenberg. Joel, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Dr. Rosenberg is on duty. So um, Joel uh, is a longtime hometown friend of mine. We've known each other since like, I don't know, like fourth, fifth grade or something. We played like Little League Baseball, um, grew up near each other, all that stuff. Right? Yeah, exactly. And Yeah. And he as he came out to Jackson to visit us because he had a little bit of break in, in your med school action. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, tell... Tell the audience what um, what you're going to med school for. Uh, I'm in my last year of medical school, and I'm going to go into uh, urology, which is surgery of the urinary tract, where you focus on a lot of different cancer surgeries um, and just like quality of life issues. Definitely. Um, and so, for people that don't know, like, what are you doing in in your last year of med school like what uh what's your day-to-day like like you like what the stuff you tell me regularly yeah so my day-to-day is we go on different month long or two month long rotations uh at different hospitals rotating through different areas of medicine like pediatrics or internal medicine or surgery and then this summer is a summer that we really focus on the area of medicine where we're going to go into but Obviously, that's all suspended right now. Um, so we've got transition to online learning. And then once testing increases and there's more protective equipment, then we're going to go back into the hospitals. Yeah. So you're done. You're mostly done with like classroom work, right? Yeah. Classroom work is in the first two years. Yeah. That's cool. And do you get to pick? Does everybody have to do like the same uh, like four or five uh like different units that they rotate around to yeah everybody has to do maybe it's like eight core uh-huh. rotations and then you get to choose different elective rotations based on your interests were there any um that like surprised you and how much you that you liked them more when you got into it or that you disliked that you thought was really weird once you got into it that you didn't think would be so weird yeah every specialty has its different flow to the day Uh so surgery obviously starts extremely early in the morning but you're active a lot and you go into the operating rooms and uh, you're physically doing stuff while if you're doing an internal medicine rotation it's a lot of thinking um, a lot of planning a lot of figuring out you know what could be wrong and correcting a lot of different problems at once so uh, you got to be a uh, very good in-depth thinker for that one. Um, is that I, is that because it's like you can't? So internal medicine does that mean like organs and stuff like inside? Yeah, yeah. So you when you think of general medicine, that's yeah. what internal medicine is. Is it? Does it take all that like kind of pondering, brainstorming because you can't see what's necessarily going on all the time, and you kind of have to like brainstorm what th- what could be going on? Yeah, that's a big part of it. And a lot of the people that are sick enough to be admitted into the hospital uh, usually have many different problems going on, affecting mm-hmm. many different organ systems. So you have to think about what is going on in each organ system and how do you correct that individually, yeah. but also treat the underlying cause of, of why this is occurring. Without with uh, cutting them open being a last resort. Exactly. Hey, do you ever watch House? Yeah, I love that show. Is it like that scene when they're all like his his teams got together and they're like, "Okay, she's bleeding out of her eyes. She also peeing her pants. What could it be?" Yeah, <laughs> is it exactly. like that? And exactly. They're like, "Well, it could be this." Okay, run some tests. Well, it could be this. Okay, you go talk to a stripper outside and see what she did last <laughs> night. Yeah, Doctor House kind of does everything, so it's yeah. a little bit unrealistic, but yeah, I mean, just Taylor likes to watch those shows, but they're just so dramatic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Cool. Um. What is sort of, this is something I've been wondering, um, just from you being in med school and hearing like your path to like choosing your, um, what type of medicine you want to get into. What, what are the things you think about when you, to get you to that final decision of like what kind of doctor you want to be? 
because you start in like pre-med and it's you know anatomy biology it's super general stuff about the body and then like where do you go from like i want to be in urology <laughs> from there to like i want to be in urology yeah i think part of it is thinking about uh what kind of patients you want to be with every day mm -hmm. so if you want to be with kids every day you know you should be a pediatrician if you want to be with older you know acutely sick really sick adults you can go into the in intensive care units um and so i always knew i wanted to be with cancer patients mm -hmm. um so from being with cancer patients, you either choose medical oncology, which is through internal medicine, or you can go surgery. Uh, and then urology, I figured out, was a surgery um, specialty that deals with a lot of cancer patients. But then there's also these other different aspects of urology where you're still doing short uh, but very important procedures like oh, yeah. um, breaking up kidney stones mm. um, for people that get a lot of kidney stones or men with um, urinary dysfunction. There's many different short, quick procedures that uh, you can you can do to, to help them with that. Uh, and then part of it too is you learn to love certain diseases and some of the stuff, and maybe this is just by chance, or, um, but I know a couple of different people who have kidney cancer, or prostate cancer, and you start to get interested in that. And then um, there's a lot of different researchers at the University of Minnesota. And so I just kind of got paired with a, a kidney cancer researcher there. Yeah. And uh, my love for the urologic issues just Urologic kept growing. issues. Nice. Yeah. Cool. Um, kidney stones absolutely terrify me because they're always they're portrayed in like movies and shows like so awfully and it's just and you can't really do anything to like prevent it right i mean like be healthy be hydrated right is yeah. like be healthy be hydrated a lot of it is genetic and so mm -hmm. if you know if you have a family member with kidney stones you're at a higher chance of getting it um but that just terrifies me that a, like a rock would come out of your yeah urethra yeah it's yeah no they're in a lot of pain and uh there is a lot of research going on right now too to find how to prevent kidney stones in the first place but oh really yeah yeah do you actually have to like do you, do you actually like have to like stick something in there to break it up that's yeah, oh yeah really oh my god <laughs> you that go in awful. you go in with uh a wire and then you put the stent up and you stick a, a metal rod up uh, it goes through your urethra, into your oh bladder, God. into your ureter, and you start shooting lasers at the kidney stone, and you break it up, and then you pull it out piece by piece. Oh, that's sick. I didn't know they did the lasers. I thought yeah. they just kind of like, my dumb brain was like, oh, they just poke it, and it breaks up. It's like, uh, what's the asteroids? It's like well, asteroids. It's like asteroids. <laughs> Galaga or yeah. something? Oh, man, that's hilarious. Um, How, how much, like, uh, actual, like, cutting cutting training and like the procedural training have you gone through so far because that stuff that part always freaks me out not when there's like real like full doctors doing it but it's like you my good buddy joel and you're just you're you're just joel one day and then the next day you're able to do that procedure you just said like what what um sort of like actual like the cutting training and procedural training do you guys go through yeah so as a medical student you do a equivalent of two months um doing in the in the operating room every day but as a student you're mainly kind of just holding things and putting the camera in different positions mm -hmm. and then you suture up the skin afterwards after the surgery and then uh so that's like what the basic of what every medical student gets mm -hmm. and then if you choose to go into something surgery you do extra rotations the the summer of your fourth year so you get extra practice and then after medical school is done, then you start a residency program, which is for urology, it's five to, five to six years. And there you're learning, you're mastering the craft of, uh -huh. of the different procedures in urology, which there are many. And so uh, you spend five years every day um, doing five, surgery. Five hours every day? 
No. Or no, five years. Five years. Five years. Every day you're in the cert- in the Every operation day. room. Whoa. Do and is there and that's like uh, Grey's Anatomy. That's like that. Like you're doing the cutting. That one, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Do they have like? Are there like? Tr- I don't know. Like training dolls or like vegetables or something that you guys can like practice cutting on before you get to a human. Yeah, there's a lot of different models that we use and or, I mean, or uh, cadavers. Do you yeah. guys ever work with cadaver cadavers? Um, in the first year of school, we we do. Mm. Um, but yeah, there's many different tools that we practice on. Uh, fake skin, pig's feet, you oh, can yeah. suture bananas. Yeah. Um, yeah, we get a lot of practice before we're allowed to do it. Yeah, for sure. Human. That shit, all, all the like, all the complicated medical procedures that I hear about, whether from Taylor or just like, um, Taylor explained to me the proce- how they put a ventilator in, because that's been, you know, the popular thing right mm-hmm. now is ventilators. And I thought the same thing of like, how does the guy train to do that? Because you can like fuck it up. You know, like the ventilator goes in whatever the the, the area right above the lungs is. Yeah. And then he just like fucking knocks on the rib cage and hears if it's the right sound. It's like, yep, it looks good. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of practice. Um, yeah, I've actually got to do it a couple of times so far. Um, on real the people? New, yeah. Wow. The new tools for that, they have a camera. And so you can actually see mm-hmm. there's a screen right next to it. And you can, you can actually see what you're doing and where you're going. Uh, but the scary ones are the ones where you need to do it really quick where somebody can't breathe. Yeah. And then you gotta, you, sometimes you don't have time for the camera and you gotta Or, just, or x-ray, right? They can bring an x-ray, x-ray machine in to check t- too. Afterwards, you can check it with an x-ray and make sure yeah. it's in the right spot. Yeah. All this stuff is really intense. And that you, you've shared with me, um, some of like the technological advancements to surgery and you showed some of those videos where they're like, so they're like suturing up a grape skin with robot hands. Mm-hmm. That's that's that is so insane. Yeah, so urology and uh OB gynecology is now using these robotic surgeries where you start by like you would any normal surgery or they call it laparoscopic surgery and so you stick, you know, different arms in the patient and you know, before this came along, you would operate it by your hands kind of as like extensions into the body um, with and you put different tools on these sticks uh-huh. and now you hook it up to a robot you put the hands in and then you go sit in a pod and you look through a 3d camera and oh man um, it has different tools on there where you can like uh, kind of like clamp blood vessels that you need to get rid of right now um, and then you can like suture in the body and so whoa a lot of the prostate surgery a lot of the robotic prostate surgery um, for prostate cancer is done with this now. And if you have a kidney tumor on, you know, the top of your kidney or on the bottom of your kidney, you can get away with only taking away just a little part of the kidney and uh-huh. you can do that with this robot. Sick. What should I search to find? I want to, I want to see like, what is the area of the part of the, the machine that you like the, your hands are touching? What should uh, I search to find? Uh, da Vinci. Robotic surgery. All right, so people, if you're not, if you're just listening, we're we're Google searching Da Vinci robotic surgery. Click on one of these videos, and then one of the first videos has got like gray, like robotic looking arms. Two two minutes and sixteen seconds. This video is awful, but <laughs> it's a free ad right here. Yeah, hey Da Vinci, if you need some some podcast sponsors. Yeah. Oh, wow. This is so cool, dude. And that, was that her changing like one of the tools? Mm-hmm. And you can just, you just swap in and out the different tools onto the ro- robot's like hands, basically. Exactly. And so in, in hospitals too, a lot of them are having these back to back. So this one surgeon's here, and then they have another surgeon on the back. And so uh-huh. there's usually a resident, you know, that is the key focus of teaching hospitals. Whoa, look at these things. Yeah, and then the attending surgeon, the staff surgeon, can be on the other side. And so they can, you know, they're right there for if they need to help out. Like the staff surgeon's, like, w- watching the body? No, there's one right here, and then there's one right here. And then oh. there's another surgeon at the bedside, too. Oh, whoa. 
So the the what what your hands go into, it's like little loops that your fingers go into, and then like your fingers, you flex your fingers, and that like moves stuff around and like does actions. Mm. That's insane, dude. And a big movement with your hands is only a small movement inside the body. Yeah, and it's just like a little, it's like a little tweezers, a mechanical tweezers at the end of this arm that like can it, it can rotate all these different directions and spin and twist. Oh my god, dude. Look at it. He's, yeah, he's moving like six inches with his hand and it's like a millimeter mm-hmm. in the body. Yeah. Whoa. Have you have you practiced on this yet? Yeah, they have simulations that I can practice on. Uh haven't done it in a real surgery yet. You need to go through all these different trainings uh, and skills. You have to pass all the skills before they let you. Is this and the this f- is only what a resident would get to yeah. do? Yeah. Oh, that's sick. I'm so glad we looked that up. I mean, we've talked about it before and I didn't know what it actually looked like. Um do what what percentage of of like your procedures do you think will be on something like that? Um they try to do almost all of prostate cancer surgeries with that. They do when you do when you take out part of the kidney, you, they try to do it with that uh whole kidneys, you can some of them are still done with making incision in the skin. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes for bladder cancer, you can do it. Um, so the big, out. the big cancer surgeries are yeah. are being done like that. Do you think that um, machines like that are the first step to um, making sur- making surgeons um, outdated? Where like step one is us running that machine. Step, step three hundred is that machine doing it itself? Yeah, I don't think it'll ever happen. Never ever. N- no, sir. So, I mean, every body is different. You know, you learn the anatomy, but every body is going to be a little bit different. And then there's the emergencies. Mm-hmm. I mean, you you don't want to trust a robot if there's an emergency or if a blood vessel gets nicked. Yeah, uh, you need to have somebody there that can react quick and knows exactly what they're doing Mm -hmm. and yeah i don't think uh these robotic surgeries will ever be fully automated Mm -hmm. have you have you ever heard the idea that uh or not heard the idea but so they're making uh, they're using ai to um like an ai um what is it what kind of what kind of doctor is it that would like um do x-rays and cat scans and mris and then like analyze the images to see like what's what's wrong that's a radiologist yeah so they've they're using ai to do a radiologist job because like an ai it, it, since it's not like you know cutting and stuff mm-hmm. they the machine takes the takes the images and then ai scans through all the images like in a microsecond and can figure out based on what way the way you program it what's wrong and they might need put some parameters in of like you know we think it could be a torn acl so AI look for a flash of white that says a pooling of blood around the ACL, something like that. But it's like the robot can scan images way faster and way more efficient than the human eye can. Yeah, no, that's that is taking over radiology right now, and yeah, uh, we're actually doing that. I'm a part of the research for that for kidney cancer, so you can do a CT scan for kidney cancer, and we're starting to be able to predict. Uh, what kind of surgery should you do for this? What's the risk that it's going to come back if you don't do chemotherapy after the surgery? Um, using AI or using AI teaching? Oh, that's insane! Yeah, computer learning, and then so yeah, we've been there's a, a scholarship fund set up at the University of Minnesota for this, and then uh, medicine is very evidence based, and we're always trying to find new ways to improve outcomes for patients, and so. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is something that, you know, is, is the new hot topic in medicine and I yeah. think it's going to continue to grow. Yeah. It's scary when the robots start coming for doctors <laughs> Yeah, and radiologists. Yeah. Um, that's awesome. And so the U of M, you go to the university of Minnesota. Um, it's like their whole thing is like a research institute, right? That's like their whole shtick is like, we're a research, like the entire U of M is like, they do. They yeah. Do all the university hospitals are really focused on research as well as patient care. But, you know, if you go to a different private hospital, they usually don't do research, but university hospitals always do a lot of research. Yeah. 
yeah so it's probably a good like a place good place to be if you're interested in like the 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 cutting edge of of medicine exactly right? yeah yeah awesome well um so you're out here in jackson it is your third is it your third time here or second time here this is my third time in jackson third time in jackson you made the drive all the way from minneapolis on your own how what do you think of the drive uh it was long but i was excited to get here yeah the drive out is always that that uh the exciting expectations of the trip and so it's really fun and it gets it gets more scenic the farther west you go mm. so it's like it, it kind of builds your excitement you're saying south dakota isn't scenic i'm saying south dakota <laughs> most of south dakota is not scenic yeah. and like well even you start in minneapolis you go like southern minnesota it's just cornfields you go south dakota it's like just open plains and the black the black hills are cool and then if you went to the, through the bighorn mountains are cool right did you go through the, did you go through um what city is that uh i can't think of city but there's the bighorn mountains are in like north kind of east central wyoming mm -hmm. they're cool um and then there's a blank spot between like riverton and dubois <laughs> nothing there yeah that was a tough part of the drive yeah um and then, but then once you get to dubois it's really cool there you, you get around these like red rock features and you'll see like elk and stuff mm -hmm. so it gets better but then on the way back i hate to break it to you it sucks because you're leaving, like it takes 40 minutes like to get to the Tetons, and then it's after that it's downhill, <laughs> like literally downhill because we're at elevation. But then also, it gets flatter and flatter and more cornfields, and you're just like, Ugh. and you're leaving. Go a home. Great spot. Yeah, I have to go home. Like the scenery is shitty. I still have 14 hours to go. Yeah, I'm alone. Yeah, I'm not looking forward to that. <laughs> yeah, throw on throw on a podcast, and that's what I do when we 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 did that drive like four four times last year mm -hmm. tan and i would just switch off podcasts like one joe rogan podcast that i could find is a good one like three and a half hours great and then like she'll do like one of those murder podcasts and switch to like some just xm radio and and then just kind of maybe sleep some a little no bit shoes radio a lot of no shoes radio oh, yeah. that's been on my favorites that's like until recently that was like the main reason i kept it because <laughs> i had it on like my last car and then i kept it on my truck now it's legit. Um, so uh, when you when you first came out here, was that with um, was that with my dad and Ryan? Yeah, it was. Yeah, we they we had this trip all planned to come out here in the winter do some skiing when Joel and I were in college, and the trip was already booked. And I tore my ACL playing football, and so then Joel still came out with my brother and my dad <laughs> to go skiing. Yeah, I don't get why I wouldn't. Yeah. I just got to take your spot. Yeah. Um, and you said earlier you, they, you had a story you wanted to tell about that inst that trip. Um, so this would be the time to share it. Um, well, I'm an okay skier. I'm not like the best skier or anything. Uh, but we would always wake up really early in the morning uh, to go skiing. So, you know, get breakfast, coffee at the hotel. And then we start off on some of the smaller uh, hills at Jackson. And then, you know, after we got a couple in, we went up to, uh, we, you know, the food was going through me, the coffee was going through me. I realized that I needed to, to go number two. And so I told Chuck, I'm like, hey, Chuck, I'm just going to head straight to the uh, chalet. The you know, Casper halfway, Lodge. The right? Casper Lodge, like halfway down the mountain. Yeah, and then so I like start going down, and I'm like, oh man, I gotta, I really gotta go, I gotta <laughs> go a lot faster now, and so I just start like booking it down the mountain, and I'm not a great skier or anything, and I'm like coming right to one of the catwalks, and I'm still just like flying because I really gotta go, and then I fall, and it was like a bad fall, both skis fell off, oh yard like, sale, bruise everywhere, <laughs> my knee was like so so torn up, and uh. Yeah, but I, I, was, I was still dry. I had to check that, and I made it made it to the lodge and just, like, ran right downstairs. And and uh, I go into the bathroom, and I'm, like, running into the bathroom, and your dad is standing there peeing, and I have my, my helmet on and my ski goggles on, and he's like, Rosen, what are you doing? I'm like, I'll talk to you later, Chuck. 
<laughs> yeah, you yeah. didn't have time to take off your goggles and helmet because you just shit so bad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was uh oh, that's hilarious. That was my Chuck my, likes telling my, that story. My, my favorite slash funniest, most embarrassing story from skiing at Jackson. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's fucking hilarious. Um <laughs> <laughs> so separate from the bathrooms what did you think of like the size of the ski resort the feel of the ski resort like y- like you said you're not a you're not a great skier but you did fine here and i've skied with you before and you do fine yeah but like you know how's it feel coming in as like not an expert yeah uh i usually don't lack confidence when it's coming to <laughs> to sports and yeah i usually like to talk a little crap and so you know i was, I was uh Expecting that I could handle it a little bit better than I did. It's it's really steep. It's steeper than anything yeah. I've ever skied before. Um, and you and I, you've I, skied. Uh, what where other where else have you skied outside of like Minnesota? Um, in Colorado a couple times, like Steamboat and Copper Mountain. Didn't uh, your family go to? Do you guys used to go to Switzerland when you were little? Yeah, when we were, my family is really good family friends in Switzerland. Yeah. So I learned to ski there when I was three, and then I went back there a couple of years ago, and we skied one time. It was like kind of late in the year, but I got to ski there as well in the in the Swiss Alps, which is super cool. What resort was that? Like Zermatt? Ooh, I can't remember what it's called. It's oh. on the backside of Chamonix. Chamonix is the big one there, in but France. this was that's a in, smaller yeah. one. Yeah, it's right on the French side. Oh yeah, that's sick. Yeah. How do how do how do the Alps compare to like what you've seen here and in Colorado and stuff? Um, it was very similar to Colorado. I would say that it was easier with the place I skied was easier than here. Mm -hmm. Um, but I've never skied with you here. I don't think. And so I've never done like the back bowls and, you know, I've kind of just skied with done what your dad does. Yeah. And I think that trip too, there wasn't great snow and it was just super cold. Right. Yeah, it's freezing. Yeah, it's so cold. with those with those conditions, and he, Chuck doesn't really go out of bounds anyways. But like, he's if, usually at the at the hot tub in the bar by noon or one. Yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> Chuck's Chuck's rule is hot tub by three, because he talked to a ski patroller once, and they said that like ninety percent of their injuries come between three and four because everyone's tired at the end of the day and then they get lackadaisical and they eat shit. Yeah. So Chuck's like, all right, I'll be in the hot tub before then. So you won't even need to worry about me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, makes sense. yeah. So like, and us kids are like ripping up until like, we were, you know, we're taking last chairs up because we yeah. need to get as many rounds as we can in. But Chuck's been in the hot tub, showered out and back over to the bar by made, us. Made some new friends already. Yeah. He's been hiking around in his hiking boots. Yeah. We got, I got to get Chuck on here. Dad, next time you come out, you're coming on the podcast. <laughs> I asked him one day and he wouldn't do it. You can get him to. Yeah. And I'll, I'll say the only way you can stay in the house is if you go on the podcast. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Um, awesome. And so that, that was in the winter. So now you're here in the summer. A little bit different. But um, talk about like what you like about being here in the summer versus the winter and, and the stuff that we've done. Yeah, I've loved it so far. We uh, went over to Teton Lynx golf course the links at teton peaks the links at teton peaks golf course um which is awesome it's my first time ever golfing in a in a mountain setting uh and then we went on a hike on monday which was was incredible as well um very steep at a spot and go up and ride down and go to a new spot and uh, I think I almost like Jackson in the summer more. There's a, there's a lot of different activities to do and Yeah, totally. Yeah, we we were with the mountain biking, we were um we rented from Wilson Backcountry Sports, my friends over at Wil- Wilson Backcountry Sports. Um we tried to go to Phillips Ridge, but it was raining on us there and they were like, "All right, let's go look over somewhere else." And we could see it was kind of clear over a pass, a trail on the pass. So like, all right, let's do that. And it kind of, it's kind of sprinkled on us there, right? Like a little bit. Just a little bit. Yeah. And it was windy, but then we got in the trail and it was good. And then that one was probably a little bit too hard. I mean, it, I, I purposely did that one so that like, kind of like baptism by fire, like the other ones you'd be totally cool with. Yeah. Cause, um, this, this trail parallel, there's like some pretty big jumps on there, but you can still ride around them and there's some 
chunky rock areas that if you don't really know how to navigate a mountain bike, they're tough. So Joel kind of had to walk a little bit. But then after got warmed up on that, we went back over to the Cache Creek area because it looked sunny over there. We we're kind of just chasing the storm, being chased around by the storm. Did putt putt, um, which you like? Do you like that one, right? Yeah, it did. that was wet. Yeah. That was kind of wet. Yeah, it wasn't very steep. It was pretty flat. Yeah, and then we did uh, Farrens, which is probably my top two favorite trails here. Yeah, that was my favorite. Yeah, and even above where we went, we didn't go all the way up because of daylight. Um, it's above where we were. It's like three big, really long switchbacks, so you can just fly down these switchbacks, and you're just the trees are really tight around you, so you feel you're just flying through the trees, and then when you get up to the top you can see the grand and there's a little hangout spot at the top and it's it's kind of just a good like it's a fun place to hang out